Okay, so if I talk, you can hear me. It's using that and the TV and the camera, and we're doing just fine. Boom. Okay, so I think that we're ready. We're almost there, and OBS can look over here. You can go up there, do a slideshow presenter view. You can come over to here. Yeah, that's very reasonable. Do that and that. And next. Great. You can be F11 up to there. And Alt tab. So fusion. Cool. We can do full size fusion just like this.
Zoom, 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 zoom. Cool. All right. Well, you're there. Mm -hmm. Do much bigger. We're recording. Do 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 do. All right. So it looks like you're able to hear me on Zoom with this cable output. Let's see what's the. Yeah, unmute myself. Okay. Now we want to do. Okay. So the gain. Might be test speaker. Yes. Okay. And if I talk, let's see. Input level looks fine. Yeah. All good. Okay. Okay, so now I can talk at the microphone. Should be working just fine. We hit and test. Good, that's good. We're recording. Cut. Check out these. We have this like, here's a drill bit, and you can see it's pointed on those ends. They're, they're pointed up. It's only pointy. Hey.
let's say a pompous chant, and a chant of the Nikkei. That looks looks good. Why is it the chat in the do 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 queuing up things to get ready? Oh, you can and it and it and it looks. Stop the screen share for a second. Come over here. Gate slideshow presenter view like this. You can then look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's one there. Share my screen. That one. I'm just sort of mumbling to myself. I hope you don't mind, James. This is this is just what it looks like inside my brain. Da, 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 da. I do not care. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. I had an good. unproductive week. It was great. <laughs> That's nice. A week of, of uh, just relaxing. Yeah, I watched like all of Star Wars and did like a lot of annoying stuff that I had to do in my personal life that I have been neglecting for a year. <laughs> you know, it's good. End of the year stuff. It was good. How was your holidays? Uh, it was nice. We got to travel. We made it to Michigan and then a little whirlwind tour of Ohio and everybody is healthy afterwards. So I feel like that's mission accomplished. Yeah, that's exciting. Did you uh, visit family near or far? Uh, yeah, I visited my mom and stepfather in New York state and my dad who lives in Connecticut. So yeah, local. Nice. Very, very chill, very chill week for me, which was good. I needed it. Fantastic. I'll let you get back to your setup. I think I think mostly I'm good. So nice. Yep. Yep. Came in a little early, made sure that I got it. I have been just hanging out in the room upstairs. So we'll see if anybody shows up. It might just be me. Yeah, I kind of like laid low for the end of the month of December. And then today was like, I'm gonna wait a week before I want to go sit in a classroom, probably. Like, oh, uh, yeah, totally. What I know has COVID. <laughs> and it, like, very luckily, like all people that I avoided, who I had maybe social obligations with that it didn't pan out, they all ended up getting COVID. I'm like, man, I really like, I don't know what happened, <laughs> how I avoided all of these people. <laughs> I mean, it is, it's running rampant right now. The do to do. I was showing my my students like don't look at the graph unless I'm there. <laughs> right. And like it is bonkers. Yeah. I I haven't even looked at this. I just know like it's it's wild that I I keep talking to people who are like, oh, I have COVID. Oh, I have COVID. Oh, I have COVID. Like throughout the entire yeah. pandemic, I feel like I never even met anyone who had it. And now everyone I know has it. <laughs> right. It's it like all of a sudden it just turned turned on and everybody's everybody's there right uh or oh, this is with vaccinated folks it seems like it's not that big of a deal but i don't want it <laughs> right if i can avoid getting it that's that's where i'm that's where i'm going to try and live for the next couple of days hey steve hi everybody how you doing how you doing Oh, you know, trying to dodge it, same as everybody else. One hundred percent. That's the that's the play this week, I think. Just trying to stay mostly out out of out of the way. So the is here. There's a fun graphic floating around the web right now of like the most insane Super Mario Brothers episode level whatever ever and uh you know captioned dodging coronavirus in december 2021 seems pretty pretty accurate <laughs> oh it's i i feel like 
<laughs> I don't hopefully nobody in our group has it. You know, our little our little squad. Well, I'm I mean, I teach in a school. I'm double masking. There's it's just the way the way to do it. I had pulled up. I feel like it's gloomy to do this at the start, but I'm going to pull it up again. Here's in case you haven't seen the graph recently. This is the New York Times graph which is pulling data from the CDC just for Connecticut, New Haven County. And so like, here's our last winter oh. peak. And then here's our current winter peak. The, I mean, it's bonkers. Peaks and valleys and hospitalizations. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, it's, it is, it's not, the hospitalization is much better on this one compared to the previous ones. Like every one of these over here was hospitalized. In the middle, it was a lot. And then this is much better hospitalization. So either way you slice it, it's probably it's probably good to that we're that we're remote able. <laughs> well, there you go. Now that's it's hard. Like the different I wore, I actually wore an N95 for a part of our family get together thing, like a like a proper N95. And you need like a full seal around your face, which I can't, I can't even get with a beard. And I feel Yeah, yeah, they're just a lot. I've sort of gotten used to them at this point. So just, it's just how it goes. Da, 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 da. I have to learn three, six, three. And part of the problem was your beautiful, um, tutorial sure. you just can't follow it it's too quick that, and i realized why now all right so i found a great tutorial on autodesk oh good it's excellent and what's so good about it besides it breaks everything down from the very beginning is first you it's by unit so to speak so sure and each unit first they have a six minute video or so so it's short and you know Tells you what you need to know. And then it's written with diagrams so you can see what you listen to. That. And then I do it on my laptop and follow what they did and rewind until I think I've gotten it. That's perfect. Yeah, everybody everybody has their own like best way to learn. I'm definitely a just like hop in and start clicking yeah. kind of person, but that is not everybody. It's happening to me. Do I try to follow here? So, okay, now I'm going to draw that, that shape and I'm going to extrude it. And guess what? Every time I went to draw it, nothing happened. <laughs> and I realized why, you know, like yep. you have to do to get into that tool to make it work. Yeah, getting into and out of all the different modes in Fusion is the hard part. Right. And once you like crack that code, it, yes. gets, it gets easier. Right. Slowly. So <sighs> let's see, we've got a bunch of a bunch of things to look at today. The good news is, is that the better you get 3D modeling, the the more cool advanced stuff you can make, but the skill we're headed into now, the CNC milling, you don't have to be a Fusion 360 Pro to be good at this. Like they're, they're definitely separate skills. They complement each other nicely, but it doesn't, it's like not required. That's always good to know. So I can take my time with right. Fusion 360. Right, you could, yeah, Fusion 360 is like a decade long game. And this this you can pick up easy, in a badging session. Yep. Yeah, especially with the Shapoko, which is really, it's just a treat. I'm hoping they use that on that ugly little board you brought home for me. Oh yeah. Oh crap, that's still in my house. I'll I'll bring it in and put it on the foundation shelf. It's at, I mean it's like in New Haven. It's just at my house. Yeah. Um I, I so want to see. I know I have to fill in some holes. It, uh, not that many. It's it's just like a, it's huge. <laughs> Great. Yeah. <laughs> so clean it down some if I need to. Oh, you totally, you totally can. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it'll be, I'm excited to see what it turns into. All right. Let's do our, it's 7.05. Let's have a little quiet moment so Ashley can find the spot to edit. And then we'll go from there. All right, so it is Monday, January 3rd, 2022, which feels like very much the future. And here we are for, for 
uh, another week of foundations. This week is gonna be the start of our ninth unit. This is an interesting unit because it gets split over, oh, I suppose I should click over to a face. Um, this unit gets split across a couple of weeks. We're gonna do CNC milling now, and then we're gonna sort of break away from it for a little bit. And then we'll come back to it later on when we do sort of our make something big unit where we try and make a physically large object with a CNC. And so we're just gonna cover sort of the intro things and get ourselves going with it, go over the main ideas this week. Um, and really ultimately, this is like an entire week centered around basically just one machine. We're just gonna talk about the Shapoko is gonna be our main driver. We'll reference the other machines, but if you wanted to get one badge this week, it would just be the Shapoko. And that should be clear by the time we get to the end. Um, and so CNC milling, I was chatting with my own mother on the phone this afternoon. She said, what does that even mean? And it's computer numerical controlled. And so computer numerical controlled end mills. And basically this is true for a lot of the machines in Makehaven. So like the laser is a CNC of sorts, the vinyl cutter is a CNC of sorts, anything where a computer is controlling motion, you're talking about a CNC operation. And we're just gonna be focused on CNC milling with end mills. And so as we talk about these, we're gonna cover these, these different steps to try and understand. We're gonna do a rough plan for this. We're gonna, which is a bit of a milling joke if you're way into the puns. Uh, we're gonna go through the CNC overview. We'll talk about G-code a little bit more and post-processors. Then we'll identify carbide 3D and Shapoko, which is the, the main thing of the day. And then we'll talk about VCAR, which if you're really already good, if you've already tried the Shapoko, if you wanna play with something more, VCAR would be the way to go because Carbide 3D works with just the Shapoko, but VCAR will work with all of the CNC machines that we have. And then some next steps for what you should do after this. So first up, we'll do the CNC overview. CNC is one of my favorite kinds of tools uh, like I like 3D printers, I like laser, I like lasers a lot. Um, the vinyl cutter is fun, but you can just make stickers. Once you get to CNC, you can basically start from just about any material and then make that material into what you want it to be. And so it becomes really empowering because you can work with wood, you can work with like plastics, you can, uh, if you count the water jet in, you can work with metal and stone and those sorts of things but a CNC operation will let you make controlled cuts in all sorts of different materials that really broadens the things that you can do with, with all the tools that we have. And so computer numerical control can look lots of different ways. Uh, and so the main thing, when, when you hear somebody say, I'm gonna use a CNC, they almost always mean that they're gonna use an end mill. And so that's these two tools down here, these end mills, they look kind of like drill bits. And we're gonna get into that more in a second. Um, but basically when someone says they're gonna be a CNC machinist or CNC machining something, they're usually talking about machines like the Gerber or the Tormach or our Shapoko down over here. And there's other examples of these machines. Like this is a Maslow CNC, uh, this one that's that's got a couple of bricks and a vacuum on it. This was, this is about $500 to buy one of those machines. They used to try and sell them as buy one and put it in your garage. They would even sell like a kit. So you could attach it to the rafters in your garage and then swing it down. Um, and it sort of works. I, I've heard, I've not personally used one but I've heard that they're very good in the middle of this sheet of plywood. Once you get out towards the edge they start to get a little off track um, because they're they use the sine and cosine functions a lot. And those get funny when you get to the edges of, of uh, sine and cosine. This is sort of a rendering of a large scale CNC machine. Like they might make jet airplane parts in. Um, and these machines are very, very large, very, very heavy because um, they need to be, they're very expensive to run. And we don't have one. Uh, Yale definitely does though, I've seen it. So the some of the people on the, Make Haven board, they work at the Yale, make one of the Yale maker spaces, and they have access to these giant machines with really high end things. Uh, and so machines like this are millions of dollars, but they can do some really cool stuff. And they're almost always for machining metals, but they can handle just about anything. And so there's different types of machines. Some of them are really, really open ended. This one might even be a laser. It's a little hard to tell from the picture, um, but any sort of computer controlled motion, that's all gonna count as a CNC. And so the big thing 
is that CNCs use end mills. And so I'm gonna, here's an end mill for Lisa in person. And we have an end mill versus a drill bit. These are two things that look really similar, um, but the big difference is what the cutting edge is. And so on the, on the two things, for an end mill, I'm gonna stop presenting really quickly and like point at something in, in real space. So here's an end mill that I'm holding up in front of the camera, or I can even cut over to this other camera. An end mill like this, and so I'm just pointing with this thing. Uh, the end mill has all of its cutting edges along here. And if you can get a good look at this, if it's uh, focused properly, you can even sort of see the little micro bevel right along the edge of this cutting surface. And so this sort of a tool cuts as it spins along this way. And so you can imagine it sort of spinning like this and doing a cutting operation as it goes. It's, it's cutting along its edge, not so much along its tip. And that's very different from a drill bit. Here's our drill bit example. And so this drill bit, these are both giant examples of these things because uh, it's easier to point at. A drill bit is really only sharp at its tip. So just this front edge is sharpened in a drill bit. The rest of it is there so that you can remove all the chips away, but it's not necessarily even sharpened along these surfaces. Usually they're, they're sharp enough you'd cut yourself, but they're not with a cutting edge. And so on a drill bit, you've got this, this thing is sort of like the gullet on a, on a table saw blade where it's to remove the material out. And on an end mill, they're kind of gullets. They're kind of not. The, the main thing is that they want to be there to remove material and to, to cut it up. And then the end mill sort of moves out of the way as it goes. These come in all sorts of different sizes. Uh, I like to, I actually buy and carry my own around. This is a quarter inch end mill that I have. And this is a, you can, if you look at the blades on them, they spin in opposite directions. We're going to get into that in a second. This is a down cut end mill. I use that a lot for wood. We'll talk about that more in a bit. And then they come in all sorts of sizes. Here's a little teeny tiny one. And this is by no means the smallest one that I've used. This is, it looks like a 1 16th end mill. And so this will get you much smaller than other things. And it's a, it's a ball nose end mill. So at the end, it's not squared off at the tip like this one is. Um, it's got a little round to its tip. And so there's all these different tools that you might have, but it, the big thing, is that end mills and uh, drill bits look the same, but are not the same. And so that throws people a lot early on in their, in their, in their learning this. So I tried to draw in these pink lines on the end mill just to highlight that those are the cutting surfaces. And you can see how it would sort of cut away on the edge of this piece of metal versus drill bits, all of their cutting edges are right on the tip. And so that's the big difference there. Uh, drill bits tend to be cheap. They're consumable things. They're something that you pop into the tool. We usually just say that the tool is the drill and the, the bit is sort of a consumable that goes in it. Whereas end mills themselves are often called the tool that you're using. So the CNC machine is the machine, but the tool itself is the end mill. And so they are often much more expensive. Um, you can get them with coatings. And so like the ones that are here on screen, these brass looking ones have a coating on them or this even this coating is there so they stay sharp for longer. We have an end mill sharpener downstairs. It's a badge you can get if you want um, for these things to last longer. But usually these end mill pieces are, are meant to last for a fairly long time, um, but they're still sort of consumable. Uh, whereas drill bits are almost always pretty cheap. And if you break one, it's not too bad. Uh, I once laid a whole floor and you can, you can buy eighth inch drill bits by the dozen because <laughs> you'll break them off every so often. So it's, it's just the way that it goes. Um, but end mills are fascinating to see how they work and mad props to Jonathan Katz Moses on YouTube for recording these. Uh, I've turned them into GIFs and thank you to him for making the original content. But there's many different types of end mills that exist. The cheapest end mill for our Shipoka would be a straight bit like this. A straight bit end mill is gonna do the same thing as these others. They all rotate in the same direction. Um, a straight bit just has one flat cutting surface and those flat cutting surfaces sort of scoop away material and it works really nicely to make those cuts. They're cheap to make. These are probably the cheapest end mills to get your hands on and, and they work pretty well. 
Um, you'll notice the material is chattering a lot. It's it, That would be making a loud, annoying noise as it's doing it. A straight bit doesn't do anything to sort of push the work. It just sort of shakes as it's scooping away. And so it's it's just making big grabs of material and then pulling it away. You can see all of the dust that's coming off with each bite. An upcut bit is really common in metalworking where you want to get all of your chips away really fast. Um, an upcut bit you can see on its spiral and sort of this diagonal part right there, you can look at it, sort of scoop the, the wood upward. And so this is going to pull all your fibers up and away from the workpiece. That's really important for metal. Um, but in wood, you'll get this sort of fraying of the top edge, which can be a, a bit tricky. Um, but you'll notice that there's a lot less chatter, that any angle on your blades, instead of being a straight cut bit, whether you're up or down, it's much, much less chatter on the material because you're adding some motion to sort of scoop away the chips instead of just sort of grabbing them. Um, and then the down cut bit is my personal favorite. Those are the ones that I buy and make sure that I have nice sharp ones of. These I would only advise for cutting wood. I would not try and cut metal with a down cut bit because you need your chips to go somewhere with metal cutting. Um, but wood is a little bit more compressible than metal. So when you do this sort of a cutting operation, you're cutting and if you're way into your motion vectors, there's the sideways motion of this diagonal and then there's also a downward motion. And so when it does that, you don't get fraying at the top edge. It sort of takes the cut and slices it downward. So you get a much cleaner top surface and it usually is pushing it down against the bed. So it's it's very unlikely that your piece is gonna come flying away from the machine, which is still pretty rare overall. But if you're trying to find the right bit, there's, there's all sorts of things to consider. Um, the upcut bits, we have tons of downstairs for free. They're totally fine to use. They work great if you're just getting started. They're a great place to get going with, with tools. Um, if you can, I would avoid the straight bits. They work fine. If you're doing roughing, they can be really great. Um, if you try to remove a lot of material really fast, then you're gonna come back later and, and have a nice finish. But these three dynamics you wanna think about. And it takes a little bit of working, but always these, these tools are spun in the same direction. They're always spun in the holding down from the top or holding, holding from this back end, I suppose, you're always spinning them in the clockwise motion. And I just sort of know that by instinct at this point, it just is always gonna turn that way. And so with this end mill that maybe you can see very small on screen, um, it's going to have its angle pulling upward. So this is an upcut bit to pull those chips up. And it puts it into this category. This is a detail that's really interesting to think about. When you're just getting started, this may not be the first thing you, you consider, but if you're gonna buy one of these, if you're looking to buy, I would buy a quarter inch down cut bit. And I can put a direct link for Amazon stuff in the chat if you want. Um, however, there are many, many, many types of end mills. So running out to buy one right now is not the first thing that you wanna do. There's tons and tons of types. In McMaster card, there's 5,416 products, right? There's, there's tons of options. And so square or ball nose are the most common end types. There's square ball nose and tapered, angle bit, surfacing. You can get them coated or uncoated with tool steel or carbide. You can get straight edge or down cut, up cut, compression bits. Those are, those are fancy ones. Um, you can get all sorts of different shank diameters. That's the size of the tool that, that it's held by, the size that it's held by, and then the number of flutes or the number of cutting edges. There's lots of details that go into this, and it can be sort of overwhelming at the start, and I, I don't want you to, to feel like you have to figure out all of the things of end mills right at the beginning, but you should know that they all exist, at, at least that there is somewhere a thing you could look up and find them. Uh, if I were to make a recommendation for if you wanted to get one, I would go with a squared bottom coated tool steel up cut bit just to get you started. A down cut bit isn't bad. We have a whole bunch of square coated tool steel up cut bits downstairs that you can use for free without having to buy anything. And so that's, that's definitely a good place to get started. Usually they're quarter inch shank diameter and two flutes, which means they have two cutting edges. Um, if you wanted to see more about all of these different types, there's some, this is actually that video that I referenced before with those GIFs. This is fantastic. I'll put a link to this in the chat where he, 
Jonathan Katz Moses goes through this in slow motion and shows you the difference in all the different types of bits, how they operate, what the down cut and up cut looks like. So you can see how these things all work out. Compression is an interesting one. You can see there's sort of a break. This has both down and up cut in the same bit, which is really cool. They're also often much more expensive because that's complicated to make. Um, but it means that you can get a really nice top and bottom finish all in one go. Uh, don't buy this as your first end mill. You kind of need to know what you're looking for if you want to get one of those. But um, you can see how these have sort of fun flared ends at the top. And all of these different tools have their, their costs and benefits, the, the reasons why you'd pick them or not. And so let's hop out of here and go back over to our slides. Yeah. So, whoops, well, I don't know, I'm a master car. So, um, making some adjustments, escape back out of here. So there's end mills and milling cutters while we're here. There's just all these different types. Most of what we're gonna do are so square edge, square end mills. And this is gonna have a lot of different categories. Ours are gonna look more like this. When you have these big ones, these are for metalworking. I would not recommend that you start with metalworking this week. You don't wanna hop into there unless, you're, unless you already know what you're up to. So, whoops, click it again. So if we do wanna know what we're up to, these are sort of the different size machines that we have. Essentially, there's three different categories of machine that we have, or three different CNC machines in the Makehaven space that all are spinning end mills. This is our Shipoko. And so this is what the end mill, the end effector looks like on the Shipoko. It's a handheld palm router that's mounted into a gimbal that moves around. Um, then there's the Gerber and the Tormach. These are our three machines. The Shipoko is in the back corner of the wood shop. The Gerber is the big one in the wood shop. And the Tormach is kind of small and it's in the metal shop. Basically, if, if you were trying to understand these machines and how they fit together, you wanna to think about them in their various properties. So one property that's really important is to think about machine rigidity. So how stable is it? How big and heavy is it? The very large expensive machines are expensive partially because they're large. Um, if the machine body itself weighs a ton and a half, they can use that as a very solid anchor so that the tool doesn't shake around very much while it's doing its cutting. Um, and if you're really trying to make high-end parts, you'll be worried about your tool run out um, to make that happen. For us, that's probably not a big deal. But the Shipoko is great. It's a big upgrade from the one that we had last year. If you were around last year and saw the yellow one, we just got a relatively new one, brand new one, I guess. And it is much better than it used to be, but still less rigid than the Gerber or the Tormach. It's, it's put together with rollers and belts and things that drive it around. It's great, don't get me wrong, um, but it's just not as rigid as the other two. The Gerber is really good for handling anything plywood size or lumber, large pieces. It's really good for that. And the Tormach takes it up another notch. It's not a big heavy machine, but internally it's very rigid. So it's good for making small metal pieces. Um, machine size is also something you want to think about when you're imagining what kind of CNC you'd want to use. The Tormach is very small. It's less than 12 inches for sure. It might even be like eight inches, like significantly less than 12 inches. Um, this won't hold anything very big, and it's usually for small metal pieces. The Gerber or the Shipoko is about 30 inches across, and so it's able to cut things that are, you know, not, not, terribly small, but kind of smaller. Uh, this is good for like address signs or, or you know, signs and icons and, and little things. Uh, if you want a fun shaped charcuterie board, it would be good for that. Um, there's all sorts of options with the Shipoko that, that become available. But if you wanna make something very large, you're gonna be doing it on the Gerber. The Gerber is four feet wide by eight feet long. It will just accept a full sheet of plywood so you can slide it in without a problem and then just go from there. Um, and so the big size is really, really helpful. You can definitely make furniture just pop into existence on that machine. The barrier to entry for each of these, I would say for the, the Shipoko is very, very low. We're gonna see that there's a software stack that's very nice. You can design something in two dimensions, 
Uh, you could pull it in from Inkscape, import an SVG, and just say, I want you to cut here, here, and here, and it'll do it for you. And it sort of solves all the weird, the weird details of a CNC. The Tormac is then probably the next easiest to learn. You have to learn a lot more CNC things, but the software that it, that you use on the way to getting this to operate is pretty buttoned up. It's very much a professional machine and company, Tormac. They're the ones who make those big, heavy machines. Um, and so they really have all of their loose ends tied up in the software. And it's not, it's not too bad to get up and running. Whereas the Gerber is going to be sort of our most complicated to run machine um, of the three. But that does not mean it isn't, it's, it's still something that you can learn pretty easily in, in an afternoon. And so if you, I would 100% recommend you do the Shipoko first, and then you work your way up to the Gerber after you've done one or two Shipoko projects. The Gerber is lots of fun. And once you figure out how to use the Gerber, you may not move back to the Shipoko because it's bigger, it's faster, it's stronger. Um, but you, you also may, may be able to fit things onto the, the smaller Shipoko when you want to. So there's all sorts of interesting dynamics to these three machines and how you'd be playing with them together. And we're gonna deal with the one that's a little bit less rigid. It's got a decent size, but a very low barrier to entry that checks all the right boxes for us this week. And so we're gonna do that. Um, a big thing that's gonna come in is, is we'll be able to make all sorts of interesting and controlled corners and cuts. We'll be doing dog bones and, and fun things to make all of our designs fit on here. But um, as we do, and so there's these dog bones that are down here. Um, as you're making in designs, we'll use different software. Vectric is for VCarve. We'll sort of get into this later. Let's actually skip that and move on. Um, so G-code and post-processors. So just like we saw for 3D printers, you couldn't directly take a design and then just make it printed. You have to slice it in between. The same is true for these CNC machines. So in order to go from a design that you have into something that you make, you're gonna to have to have a couple intervening steps. So you CAD your design, the thing that you would like to make. This is a catch basin tray I'm making for my robot bartender. I probably need to upgrade this design, um, but you'll make your CAD design. Then you'll need to do the cam work that says, okay, I want this thing. Here's how you need to move the end mill to actually make it for me. And usually that will require you to have an idea of how big the stock is, the wood piece that you're gonna cut it out from or whatever you're gonna cut it out from. And then how do you want the tool to move to make that happen? And then the CAM software outputs G-code that the machine follows very much like a 3D printer does, except instead of temperature, it, it describes how fast the spindle should spin or if you need to do any operations to move things around. All of that is handled in the G-code. And the way that you get from CAM to G-code is through a post-processor, which is just something that makes sure that it's exactly right for your particular machine. And so, you output G-code like this, you can maybe see they're very tiny, uh, but little lines running through there where it's reading off a whole bunch of commands and it would be able to cut out this crazy shape. And up here is just a machine running through the motions of, of actually moving around. So it's actually pretty consistent from 3D printing. It's just applied to a different end effector in a lot of ways. G-code is again, not something that you're gonna need to know. Um, it's a little more likely you could benefit from knowing a few commands for this, but still it's not worth even trying to learn them. Um, if you get stuck and need some G-code controls, uh, it can be interesting, but there's plenty of cheat sheets out there for you to, to figure it out. The, the big thing is that you won't need to, you should not need to know this. All of the software stacks that we're gonna talk about, you will not need to know how to read or write any G-code, but you should know that it is a Turing complete, complete language where you can write programs in it, you can put commands, and basically all you're doing is drawing three-dimensional shapes inside of this code, which is, which is kind of fascinating. Um, so if you're gonna use this software, you're gonna need to have different software for each one of our machines. And so that, that's one of the downsides because it's sort of machine specific, there is some element of how do you get the post-processors to work? How do you get these things to, to connect? Um, the G code that goes along with it is going to be different. For the Gerber, we use Linux CNC as its controller. And so that needs to have the EMC2 post processor. You won't need to know that for a while. We're going to play with Carbide 3D in just a second. 
uh, and that's for the Shipoko. So this is the Shipoko and Carbide 3D is what we're gonna use. And then if you wanted to use the Tormach, that uses a different one called PathPilot that, that is for uh, just that machine. And so each one of these post-processors, what they're doing is they're sort of the output, the exit ticket from you're doing your CAM design. This is what gets it to be the specifics for your machine. You can imagine that like on the Shipoko, there's different things it needs to do to get set up and to run successfully. And so the post-processor makes sure that each one of the machines has all of those boxes checked and you're not accidentally running from G code from one machine on a, on a different one and then, and then things start to break. Um, so it's an important detail. The good news is, is that because Carbide 3D is so easy, it, you don't have to worry about that in your first go around. And so we can just pull up uh, Carbide Create and it's opening on, uh, on my laptop screen. It'll open eventually. But these different softwares, they let us move through the different things. As you're thinking about it, what you're really doing in those design softwares is you're doing this CAM work. And so here you can sort of see a red shape that's inside there. And in CAM, you're going to be organizing how do you want to work with your material and make that shape. So this sort of tan colored box is the original material or here it's depicted as green. There is my tool that would actually do the cutting. And you need to make some choices in this process for how do you want that to get made. This is, it makes good pictures for three-dimensional shape uh, cutting, but that's not how you're gonna go after it for your first examples. We're gonna do work in a two-dimensional space for the, for the first things that you make. So it'll be a lot easier to just draw in, you know, you wanna create a circle, you wanna create a square, maybe you wanna write in some text. These sorts of, I mean, something very small. Uh, these sorts of shapes are much, much easier to think about if you just want to put in some text and have it say, hello, mom, you can, you can totally do that. Uh, and so these different shapes are going to be much easier to think about than the three-dimensional stuff. But basically, you can come in and work with something like this to actually make your tool paths. So for us, you'd have these shapes. And you'll make some choices there. But there's a lot of pieces that are going to feel the same. You're going to need to think about, do you want to cut from the top of the material that you're working with or the bottom? Are you going to, you'll need to know what the machine home is, the work home. G-code has its own separate home in some machines, not for the Shapoko. Uh, tooling, material top and material bottom. Those sorts of things are going to need to be choices that we'll be making in just a second. So thinking about where all of these different pieces are, are real important. If you've been in to 3D print something, usually the first operation for any 3D printer is that it moves until it hits a limit switch. And when it's doing that, you can sort of see it drive and then bump up against an edge. It's trying to find a button at the end of its motion so that it can say, oh, this is where I start. This is where the machine begins. Because it doesn't know that when it powers up, it just sort of begins where it begins, then it has to find those home places. The machine home is an important reference. And it's usually the very first thing that happens on the Shipoko. Um, work home is where you have to set something, like maybe you want to start from the bottom center or the bottom edge center. Uh, and then the G code and work home are usually the same. Uh, all of these, if we come back over to here, there's some details that we can work on. Go into our design. Let's select all these and delete them. Right now, my home in this design is that red circle. So I've got my design set up right there. And you can see that I've got my stock size is 15 inches by 15 inches. My stock thickness is three quarters of an inch. That's its depth. And my zero height is the top, but I could choose it to be the bottom in this. And then my toolpath zero, I often like it to be the center, but you can choose the lower left, center left, top left, wherever you'd like it to be. These are all different options for what you're doing. And Inside of Carbide Create, it'll ask you sort of what material you're using, what's your machine. We have the Shipoko XXL uh, and, and some other details. But this is setting up your job. You're going to need to be able to describe that with your software. And so for you this week, this is what you're going to be doing inside of Carbide Create. And so this is a 15 by 15 square that's three quarters of an inch thick. Then uh, you'd write in some text. We can write in foundations and choose your favorite font. 
uh, Cooper Black looks like fun. Let's hit apply. And so we can do this and set our font height to, let's see if we'll make it in if we do 0 0.75 inches tall, hit apply. So a little bit bigger. Okay, cool. Um, so this could be a fun way to make a sign for our class. We do this. The origin you see is a, it's a point. The little red circle doesn't change size, but we hit done. And then if we wanted to actually make this, we have our design. Um, and let's go back and make sure that we've got all of our things, uh, all of our details set up here. So inside of this, let's make sure that I'm referencing the top of the material. And do, 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 do. I think I want to hit apply. And then inside of there, you need to choose your toolpath. So we'll do a V carve for this. And this is sort of the short, short version, but it's going to calculate out our things and we can, we can make a simulation of what this would be. And so that might be a button that I can't read what's on it. So aluminum, brass, pine, and then it will go in and show us our simulation. So we can we can look at lots of different things with this. I need to change my screen zoom. But we're all we're going to be making a set of choices for how we want to build that. Is this software we can download to our personal? Computer? It sure is. Carbide Carbide Create is one that you can download to your own computer, Mac or PC, I believe. Let's go to Carbide Create's website and make sure that that's true. Um, Carbide 3D software. There's even, so Carbide Create, if we go to Carbide 3D, this is the company that's there. There's Carbide Motion 5, that's the, the, the software that actually runs the machine. Carbide Create is how you design things. Mesh Cam and Carbide Motion V3 are not the ones you want. So Carbide Create is the one that you're gonna use and it has Mac and Windows releases. So those are both available. Um, there's a pro version, but you can do lots of things with this. It's got lots of the vector design options that we have, and it can totally import DXF and SVGs. So if you have designs you like, you can, you can do that. Um, the Back to these slides. You'll want to think a lot about whether you want to reference your machine surface, material surface or machine bed. If you're making, an, if you're going to make an engraving like we did on the laser, then you want to reference it from the surface. If you want to do a cut like you do on the laser, you want to reference it to the machine bed. Um, it's an important difference. The engraving you want to have only be so deep into the material. So you reference it to the top. So it, it knows sort of where the top of the material is. When you're making a cut, you want to reference it to the machine bed um, because your thickness could be slightly off. But if you reference it to the bottom of the machine, then you're not going to cut away deeper into the machine than you think it could. Um, the thing about these machines in the Shipoko, if we pop over to here, is this tool can actually cut right into the bottom of the machine. So it does take a little bit of care to make sure that you're not gonna cut through the machine itself. And that's why we're being particular about these material surface and bed surface things. You wanna make sure that if you're doing an engraving, you go from the surface. And if you're doing a cut, you go from the bed. But if you're going to run the Shapoko, the software that I've already pulled up and, and started looking at, you should know that it's all run by this company, Carbide 3D. It's a company that makes a whole collection of small CNC machines. And they, I think they used to be, they appear to be a spinoff or rebranding of Inventables, which made our previous Shapoko. It's the same name, slightly a different company that made the machine. And so they make software and they make the machine all as one integrated package. Um, it's really a much nicer, a much improved machine if you got to see the two of them, but they offer many different machines and they're all controlled by this Carbide 3D software, which is great, a great place for beginners where lots and lots of woodworkers would be totally happy to just have a, a Carbide 3D machine in their shop. And so here is an example of one that's pretty buttoned up instead of me just drawing shapes and things. Um, you can do, you can import vectors like that's KK slider from Animal Crossing and then the, the nook leaf. And once you have those vectors in there, you can make little cutaways. So this would be cutting away at sort of the border of that shape. Um, and then you could imagine I might cut out the outside edge and we could have a, a strange cutting board. 
uh, of, of a video game character. But this software really works nicely to control the machine. It's integrated perfectly, and it, it sort of knows all the specifics of that machine. It's one of the benefits of having a company that builds the hardware and the software all together. It's been sort of Apple's shtick the whole time that they build the hardware and the software, and so they, they know that it's integrated well. The same is true for Carbide 3D. Um, however, if you dig a little deeper, their machines are really not a whole lot more than an Arduino project. Um, the Shapoko Pro is using a Gerbil command, which is an Arduino program that someone wrote online. The software Carbide Create and Carbide Motion are just sending commands to that Arduino that's driving it. And it, and it really is just an advanced Arduino project that a company is selling. So ultimately, there's lots of ways to work around this. So if you wanted to design outside of Carbide Create, but still involve it into Carbide Motion, that's totally possible. Um, there's lots of ways to sort of shortcut this software, but that's not usually how you want to start. The first thing to do is to just get Carbide Create and play around a little bit, and then you can make some really nice products without a whole lot of effort. Um, and so that's something that you definitely want to take a look at. Like this would make a, a one-tenth of an inch deep cut to make that little character. Um, you can totally though, if you like this process and wanna go deeper, you can upload your own G code to Carbide Motion. And so Carbide Motion is what drives the Shapoko. You can upload your own and get weird actions like this sort of spiral that's happening with your own G code processors. And so we're gonna look at VCAR for just a second to see what is another way in so that if you wanted to write your own G-code commands, you could do that and then have it sent to the Shapoko or any of the other machines. Um, it's, it's valuable to mention and sort of talk about to look at vCarve at this point, not because it's the thing that you're gonna use this week, but because it's definitely the next logical extension once you've played around with the Shapoko just a little bit. And so, there's some details, like we'll need to get the post processor to work. This is actually Easel, which is Inventables version of Carbide Motion. Um, but this, you'll need to be a little bit more conscious of some of the details if you're getting into it. So VCarve is the next thing that we're going to look at. It's totally the way that you can set up G-code for all three of the CNC machines that we have. It is, and I have it open over here. Here is vCarve all pulled up and ready to go. It's got a different look than Carbide Motion, but in a lot of ways, it's doing the same thing. This is the stool that we had an example of. So I took this stool out of Fusion 360, um, all of these designs, and I manually put in little dog bones and things. Um, this was a tutorial video that you could have watched where it's got all those details for how you'd want to make this. I exported those DXFs for these shapes, those right there, and brought them into vCarve. And so within vCarve, you can start to click on shapes like, uh, like this one, if it'll let me click. Do, 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 do. And so, oh, I've got this, this thing open and we'll hit cancel. And so inside of here, you can start to do cutaways where you'll say, I want to cut inside of that shape. And I would like it to cut one, uh, three quarters of an inch deep. That's how thick the material is. And you'll need to make a whole series of choices in order to do these cutting things. And a lot of this is going to, to take that and let you be able to make cuts along those shapes that you want that you want to produce. And so here's my mouse. Let's see, I can grab this. And so that lets me design motions that the tool is gonna to do if I wanted to cut this here. So there's my, the pink dotted line is sort of the design that I imported it. And then this uh, lighter colored line, that's the actual tool, tool motion. And so one of the nice things about this is that it lets me simulate what that's gonna look like. And you can see it's making a cutaway, the tool sort of going through that path, removing material in an animated, in an animated way. VCarve has a lot of these details all buttoned up. They look really nice. So you can see how this is going to work. Different softwares will let you do different amounts of prep to get this to, to have this make sense. And so you can set this up and do a whole set of tool paths where that is just cutting away the inside. Then after that, you might want to cut away the outside. And so for this one, you'll do a lot of things the same, but you want to do that. Maybe add tabs. 
tabs are things that you use to keep the material from flying away when you're doing these cuts. Uh, on the laser, cutting is really nice because it just cuts and removes material. The spinning end mill of a CNC machine means that this is something you have to think about from time to time. It adds these little connectors to your tools so that it doesn't fully cut it away. Um, and if we were to do the same exact thing and hit calculate, you can look at the tool paths, how it has sort of a break over here. It's not a full circle. And when we preview, preview the tool path, it goes through and there's one of the, the tabs over there. It leaves a little connected spot. So it doesn't fully separate the two things. Um, and you can see it, it definitely cuts all the way through. That's the background. For this, you need to be conscious of, is it gonna cut through? If you cut too deep, you'll leave a, a groove on the CNC machine bed. So those are all little details to think about. They're, they're not um, the first thing that you think about when you're doing this, but it's good to start to imagine tool paths and get shapes so that you can have all of this uh, come together. The first things that you're gonna do are gonna be much more like this where you come in, this is actually, let me do this. I wanna change my display settings so that it's a little bit, hold on a second. I've zoomed it in too much on this on this screen. Uh, 125. We'll pop back over to here. And for this, now it's almost too much in the other direction. We can come into here and do our V-carve toolpath, show toolpath, show simulation. So it should show the simulation for here. Uh, v carve. I'm not cutting nearly deep enough. Next step. Um, 0.5 inches. Okay. Show simulation. Yeah, I I don't have something set right. It's hard to see in this setup. Okay. Um, pop back over to here. I do have some pictures going on. Um, what you can do is set up all of your different settings. So inside of either of these, there's gonna be lots of different icons and buttons that you're gonna to need to decode. And unfortunately, one of the downsides of these softwares is that they're, they're not clear with labeling. Um, whether it's VCarve or Carbide Create, in both cases, when you're doing your drawing, just like you might've struggled with knowing what all the shapes were in Inkscape, this is its own whole other set of shapes and buttons and things to learn, uh, which can be very frustrating. And my sincere recommendation is try your very best to do all your design work in a software that you know and love, like Inkscape. And if you wanted to make a foundation sign like I had pulled up in Carbide Create, you'd wanna be able to do that in something that you're familiar with all of its settings already. Um, inside of VCarve, if I were to do the same thing, let's head back over to our 2D view. You can start to learn what all these buttons are, but we'd write uh, we'd write in text. You can do some of that. You'd need to start to learn that this button is for scaling, and so you can or to rotate. And then there's other ones here. It's this one is for scale. If we get it right, so there's Make Haven like that. And so you start to be able to learn what all of the different buttons are. VCarve, I think, is not very forgiving. The buttons on Carbide Create are a little bit better. If you want to draw a circle, it's a circle. If you want to draw a square, it looks like a square. But there's not a ton of a polyline you can start to draw in. But it's a pretty rudimentary design tool. Inkscape or Illustrator are going to get you a lot further if you're doing all your design work there. Um, and then you choose your tool paths from, from this point. So in either of these softwares, you wanna do those sorts of things. But once you're ready to make stuff, you can come in and choose these different tools and you'll start to learn that these tool paths over here are going to be very useful. Um, the default view for VCarve is got this tool path button over there. I like to hit this little pin to keep it from auto hiding on me. And this is a tool that I really like, a V car, a V bit tool, where it'll calculate these. You get this sort of weird shape, but if we preview that tool path, this is a really fun way to make, and it's previewing something over there. 
but this is a fun way to make really nice detailed letters. And so a V-bit, it's a strange thing that we pulled up, but it's a tool that um, looks like this, where it's got a V on its end. That angle there is able to cut at various widths based on how deep it is. So if you wanna get all the detail of that M or that H, including the serifs on the end of the letters, it changes the depth of that tool so that it gets the width that it needs. It's a really fun look. If you're trying to make a nice sign, we have one of these bits. It's exactly this, a 90 degree, one and a quarter inch bit downstairs. Using this in just its stock configuration can be really helpful. Um, when we get to the second week of this unit, instead of focusing on the design software, we'll drill into the details of what all of this stuff means, the speeds and feeds, the inches per minute, plunge rate, all of those things. Because as you get more advanced, you'll have to think about that. For this week, what I want you to do is ignore those details and just click through and say, yes, yes, please, click, 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 and sort of move through the design and let the software do a lot of the working for you. Um, there's plenty of ways that you can configure these things, but to get started, you just wanna do the very basics and try and get the idea of what these shapes and things are. Um, a couple of things that are important, like circle, is gonna be pretty straightforward. Scale in V-Carve looks like this. Move looks like that. Rotate and mirror. These four I think are especially cryptic, even though they're very basic operations that should be super clear. Um, another one that can be really important is to close the gaps, especially if you're designing an Inkscape or Illustrator and you're bringing it in. The first thing you'll wanna do is close gaps. Um, so if your shape has little breaks in it, it won't know quite what to do. Let's pop back over to 2D view. Um, this design right here, if I click on this, I'd like it to cut the outside of that shape. But one of the things that's tricky is that it needs to know that it's one continuous shape. So it's one closed shape with no open edges. You can imagine if I had a little gap right here, the software would have a hard time understanding what to do. And so, when you go to do a profile toolpath, it needs to be a closed shape so it can say outside or inside or directly on the line. Um, probably doesn't need to be closed to do on the line, but these sorts of details are important and tricky. If I go in and I might be able to node edit mode, if I take one of these and I delete it out, um, cut the vector and do something like that. So it's clearly broken. And now I say I wanna cut on the outside, it's going to throw me an error instead of letting me do this. It'll say no suitable vector is selected. At least one vector must be selected for this operation. So I need to select it again. Nope. With get out of um, node edit mode, exit node edit mode. So I've got it selected and I hit calculate. It will make sort of a guess um, but there's no guarantee that it's going to, to guess it the right way. So I chose on that one to be on the outside and it looks like it sort of got it. On the inside, what's the inside of that shape? It sort of calculates an estimate of what it thinks the inside is, but I've definitely seen it get it wrong. So you wanna make sure that if you've got the opportunity to, you can close these vectors in, you don't have weird gaps in them because you don't want it to behave erratically. Um, cutting on the inside of this doesn't do a whole lot of harm other than it's going to, if you want these two slots to fit together, they're going to be different sizes. Um, so choosing the right way to make it is going to be an important part of how you do this design work. So when you come into here and you have a vector that you want to cut, let's actually stop with that one. We'll click on this one and you want to cut this thing. The design tool here is different than the laser curve. If you made any vector cut boxes on the laser cutter, you'll notice that it, sometimes you had a little bit of extra space because the curve from the cut wasn't, wasn't exactly perfect. The nice thing about this software is because it knows how big your end mill is, it knows that it's exactly a quarter of an inch in diameter, it's going to be able to calculate all of that so that it cuts it pretty spot on what you're hoping for. So when you do this and you have in your design that you want this to be three quarters of an inch wide, it does all the calculations so that that should be just about exactly three quarters of an inch wide for you. It's imagining the curve is gonna be cut away by the tool. And when you do that preview, the cutaway 
Oh, I need to be in 3D view, I think. Um, sometimes vCarve can really bog down a machine. We go into 3D view in a second. It's thinking. Uh, when you do this, you'll want to make sure that you're doing the calculation and the, the part that is removed is exactly what you want it to be. So cutting on the inside, you get a three quarter inch gap. If you cut on the outside, it's going to be three quarters of an inch from this, this side to that side. And then we'll also be, um, if you were to do the outside, your kerf is this part that's removed. If your kerf was on the outside, the slot would effectively be a half an inch wider than you want it to be because of the extra kerf cut on both sides. Um, it's a hard statement to follow, but when you're doing it in, in place, it's, it's a relative, when you're able to click through instead of just talk about it, it's, it's a relatively nice one. Um, making these cuts, there's, it's worth it to know what all the different tool paths are. And so there's drilling tool paths where you just cut straight down with an end mill. Um, there's pocket tool paths where you make sort of a tray. That's a really helpful way to make trays and, and that sort of thing, or to make recesses where you'd pour an epoxy later. The outline is usually how you cut things out. V-carve is how we made those nice letters. This is a really good trick. Uh, carbide create and V-carve both have it. It's the namesake of V-carve. It's like the, the famous algorithm that they had and figured out. Um, roughing and finishing can be really neat. And so if you wanna make things, uh, all of the examples that we've done here have been basically 2D. There's some 3D-ness to this operation. Um, but if we wanted to, we can make a whole, um, a whole new thing. And so we go to file new. I don't wanna save my changes. Inside of here, we can make something that is a little thicker and VCARB is different from Carbide Create. This is really where it's got a lot of power is that you can import not just two-dimensional stuff, but you can import three-dimensional stuff. And so in, in VCARB, if I wanted to make this shape, this is something that's also designed in Fusion 360. Um, it's not particularly complicated, but it's definitely got more going on than those stool designs. Inside of here, um, we can poke this thing through and it's gonna chop off everything that's below that plane. Um, but you can make three-dimensional shapes inside of VCarve. And so if you wanted to do this, this is a great thing if you wanted to set up your designs, you'd wanna do something like this with an another end mill. So you're choosing your tool, you'd cut to the machine or sometimes you put a box around it if you wanted to have a particular shape. Let's see if it's short enough. Yeah. <laughs> So this is cutting something. It's doing a 3D roughing pass where it's gonna make a whole bunch of cuts. And it's a little hard to see there. Let me do this and pin this back out. But if we preview that tool path, so I'll preview that tool path and speed it up a little. It's gonna go through and make cuts that remove a lot of material to sort of make that star shape. You can see it's got steps on it. The steps aren't ideal, but this is gonna be able to cut away a lot of material so that I can get closer to what I wanna actually make. Um, from there in 3D, in 3D CNC, you'd usually do a finishing machine tool path afterward with a smaller, more delicate tool, usually a ball nose. You can get some really good detail and then you'll calculate that. Also, this is a more complicated tool path. It'll then walk over all of those surfaces and do, let's reset the preview and preview all the tool paths. It does the roughing, and then it does that pass where it goes over and smooths out all of the roughing. So we'll reset that again and run it again. The roughing tool path sort of takes away chunks. It gets close to what you want. And then the finishing tool path, you can see it's sort of running over step-by-step, step, taking it from a series of steps into one big smooth operation. And the simulation runs pretty quick but that finishing tool path is what gets it from a series of steps into something that's nice and smooth. Um, if you wanted, and this may seem ornate, but I've definitely seen people CNC their own guitars that come out nice and smooth on both machines, the Gerber and the Shapoko. So you can totally make your own instruments if you want, where it's designed uh, by you and then cut out by the robot. That's totally possible to do. 
I've seen them do electric guitars that way, I should say, with their solid bodies, and then they add in all the electronics. Um, but you can you can make all sorts of crazy things. You could do, well, I'm really actually super excited. There's a way to get G, um, GPS information into here because it's it's just three-dimensional data. And what I really want to do one day is to cut out a, a topographical map in here of the state of Connecticut. I think that would be lots of fun. So there's all sorts of really cool things that you can do in two dimensions or three dimensions using vCarve. It's definitely a nice upgrade to learn, um, but Carbide Create is where you should get started. You know, simple designs, write a few words, get your, get your things made. Um, you don't wanna go too crazy when you're doing your first, your first actions. I think that this material is, it's, whoops. Yep. Uh, let's see if I can get this to work. 0 0.75 and do that. I don't want tabs. We hit OK. Show simulation. Oh, that's a proper simulation. There we go. Uh, where you can get all of these, these cutouts to work. What was I doing that was wrong over here? Um, select tool. Oh, probably. If you are, so a lot of the things that we just saw in VCAR, where there's a lot of details, lots of different menus that we clicked through inside of Carbide Create it is usually a much more simplified version. Like if I want to have these tool paths, I can click on foundations and now I see what I did wrong. Inside of here, you say I wanna select my tool and there's a bunch of options, but basically you're choosing your material. Like I might be cutting out of softwood and then I want an end mill or a, a V-bit and I'm gonna use a 90 degree V-bit. The plunge rate, feed rate, all of these things you shouldn't need to change to get started. And if we hit OK, it's done the V-bit there correctly. I didn't choose the right tool. Um, and so if we create that, here's the tool paths that it's going to make. And for that, it will cut out the foundations. It's a little hard to see. I can sort of see that it's got some shading. But it will do the same exact thing where it's cutting out V-carves with the Shipoko. So those sorts of operations are really cool. Um, these V-carve signs are a really fun thing to make. If you're, an, and actually people definitely sell these um, custom signs. If you look, if we pop over to here, hit escape out of there, we can say Etsy custom signs. If you go into Etsy, there's custom sign, custom wood signs maybe. This is definitely a market where these sorts of signs can get made. Um, these are sometimes made by hand. They're sometimes made on a laser cutter. But every so often, you'll see them where they're cut with a V-carve bit. And that's a really nice way to make a, a sign that, that really lots of people enjoy. If you're going to do that, I would totally recommend, here, let's go back to presenting, uh, that you do the V-bit for something like this. I have basic button going on. and in sort of in here, you can see I was using the same exact example for this GIF for roughing and finishing tool paths. You may want to think about that. The V-carve is nice. You don't have to worry about roughing or finishing. It just sort of does it from the text. And as you do that, this is a really nice way to make a, a really good looking sign. And so you can choose your fonts. The V-bit is able to get all of the detail of these letters by just moving closer and further from the top surface. So you can get the width that you want. Um, and you'll need to make sure that when you're gonna do something like this, if you have a font that you like, you can even make your own custom designs, that you have your joined vectors, that you output tool paths and all of this works the right way. It's definitely a little trickier inside of vCarve, inside of Carbide Create, which is over here. All I need to do at the end of the day is once I have the design that I like for my little cutting board that says foundations in the middle, I just save the G code and that's it. Um, and so I can save it just like that to make the thing that I want. And so we could call this our foundations board. And I've saved the G code to my desktop where I'd be able to upload it to Carbide Create. Um, there's a, a bunch of details to get the same thing to work in vCarve, but it's probably not worth looking at right now. 
If you want to get it to work on the Gerber, you need to use this post processor, EMC2 G61 or G64 ARCs. Um, we'll get back to this when we come back through for the second pass of CNC machines. But the Carbide Create software is just a, a delight to work with. If you wanted to build a sign like this, I totally recommend cutting this out of wood. It's really great to do. If you mask it with a masking tape like you would um, for a vinyl sticker and then do your cut, then you can paint over that with the masking. And it's really nice to just paint all that in. You peel up the masking and then all of the cutaway letters are painted in and the, the raw wood can be there on the top. It's a really nice trick. You can make some really nice signs that way. Um, can you, uh, Corey? Yeah. I'm sorry. Can you repeat back? I didn't fully yeah. like understand the the G code and font. I had put in the chat, can we put like custom fonts or like fonts that we like into Car Five Create? And I feel like you just went over that, but it went over my head kind of. No, I, I did. I went really quick. Um one of the so let's say that you're inside of VCarve, inside of here. Um, because I can import any vector that I want. I can import any shape that I'd like to make with, and it can be a picture, like it could be, um, here's, I don't know what faceplate is, but we're gonna find out. It could be this faceplate right here. So this is a shape that I have, or it could be text um, inside of vCarve or Carbide Create. Let's go back to, uh, carbide create. We'll do file new, discard inside of not responding. Okay. Inside of here, the text interface. So let's say you want to make something. This interface isn't super great, right? I've got to choose my text from a list that doesn't have any styling. Um, Many of you are much more artistically inclined than I am. And so if that's true, you can instead do a file, uh, like an import. And so you can use this button here to import any sort of file that you want. And so if you wanted to make that, any SVG that you have, you can import it right from here. So if you're already good at designing in Adobe Illustrator or an in Inkscape, you can import that shape and then once you have a shape that's imported, like if I wanted to cut out these, um, these circles right here, I can just select those and then use any toolpath that I want to make that cut out. And so let's see if I got my default, select my tool. Um, but the, the big thing is that importing can come from anywhere. So I can make a design inside of Inkscape my computer is not having a good time with this. But if I open up Inkscape, make a design in here, I can pull it from Inkscape into that other software. So any shape that I want to do, so if I want to say make Haven and do this in here, I find this uh, interface much better for dealing with text. So if I wanna play with text, I can look at text and font. You get a, a better preview of what your font is gonna look like. So if I want this particular type of font that may not be available in Carbide Create, all I need to do is have this and make it large enough, save this as an SVG. Um, and so we'll just do text. And then inside of Carbide Create, I can, if I go to design, I can just import that shape. Text.svg. Sometimes they come in at crazy scales. So you might need that, or maybe it's very tiny. There's a little bit of funny business to this but getting your text to come in and out. Oh, and you know what it probably is? Uh, I probably need to do object to path. I didn't do that. Yeah, that was, that was me. Uh, object to path. 
And then let's do this where we ungroup them. Those are definitely all shapes. We can click on the node editor, look at all those nodes. Now, if I do this and say file, save as text, I should be able to get it to replace an import. So I really need to transfer that to be there. All of those nodes to come in. And so any font that I want, I should be able to get to bring into here and I can have designed it anywhere. So any software that you like to use to design your text, to make your vector designs, all of those are possible with these CNC softwares. Could you v cut that with V card, that irregular? Yep, with this, with this irregular shape, I should be able to go to toolpath and V carve, choose the right tool. And so let's, a hardwood maybe is what we wanna do, depending on what you're up to, a V bit. And I'm gonna do the 90 degree V bit just because I know how those, those work. And if I wanna cut it a half of an inch deep, I can do that and say, okay. And then I can show the simulation. So it's a little dicey to see it, but you can see that it's got that sort of clunky, not quite smooth finish to it. Um, let's see, I wish I could uh, show toolpath. I can uncheck that, right? And so it's there, you can see it's in there, it did the V cut, um, and that would be really nice. Now the thing about it, oh, that's actually a pretty good view. Um, the, in order to make that work well, if you, a lot of the time when you make that cut, that's very iconic, very visible. Um, but if we hide the simulation and we just go over to the, to the view, uh, let's see if I wanna, do this, show the simulation. If you had covered this entire piece of wood with a masking and then you make the cut, then it becomes really nice and easy to spray paint in wherever it had cut away the letters. And then when you pull up all the masking, you'll have the inside of that lettering painted. And that's a really common way that they make lots and lots of signs. I normally park over in Worcester Square and on my walk here, I pass a funeral home that's a beautiful v carve cut sign with gold lettering on the inside of the v-carve it's a really common popular high-end looking sign um, to do exactly that operation where you color in the inside of these um, with with something while you're making the cut cutting is going to take place like not the whole entire board yeah you wouldn't have to cover the whole board or you could cover with tape like right where it's going to do the cut and then just sort of paper everywhere else so your overspray doesn't catch anything um, but if you wanted to do that, you totally could. If, if I was better at editing nodes, I could probably come in and move around the actual nodes of that text. Um, it's not something that I wanna try and, and do right now, but, the, but any design that you have, you can import in from other places. Once they're in here, it's kind of hard to, uh, this would say, I would say is a clunky interface at best. For all of its oddity, VCarve is a little bit better at doing that design work. Um, but carbide create is really nice and you get those tool paths that just spill right out. Once you've got this in here, I can just save the G code for that, um, right onto the desktop and we can have, have this ready to cut in the next step. And so I'm going to leave it as it is, but you can see all of these different movements that it's going to make in blue. It's going to move the end map, the the end mill so that it makes all of the cuts that it needs to make to get that cut to happen. Um, it's a it's definitely a more nuanced thing than laser cutting. It's not as easy as the vinyl cutter um, conceptually, but it's got a lot of potential to make really cool stuff. Uh, the examples, there's there's more examples for us to take a look at. This um, was just a chance to to check out some text and play with things. What I want you to try and do this week, because there's a, a very deep well that you can go into with CNC. You can make some, you can totally just be a professional sign maker if you want. Um, the things that I'd want you to do is to just try some starter projects. Here's actually some B carved text with gold on the inside. You can do little cutaways that might be a laser project, but here's like boat signs are really common. Um, you can add in juice grooves to things with a CNC. This sort of surface level engraving is a great place to get started. Um, this, I really like to chuckle at. I have a friend who lives in the 360 State Building across the street from us. Um, in their front lobby, they have this design panel 
which is 100% just a piece of Baltic birch plywood that they use the CNC to cut weird ovals out of. That's all it is. I'm sure they paid hundreds of dollars for it because um, it is, it's beautiful art, don't get me wrong, but it's very, very simple to have to recreate if you've got access to a CNC machine. So there's some really cool stuff that you can do that can make very, very premium products with CNC machines. Your goal for this is just to try and get started with something, make a sign, uh, make some decorative design. Uh, some Somebody last year made a, a key holder. It was a lot of fun. There's tons of options for what you can do with this. And it's really neat to see what sort of options there are. Open Desk has got opportunities to build things, although that feels pretty advanced for the first week. I think a surface engraving or maybe cut something out can be a lot of fun, but you don't want it to be something big or complicated this week. So your goal is going to be to get badged on the Shipoko. That's your, that's your one goal for the week. Um, install Carbide Create and just play around in there. If you want to import from Inkscape, you totally can. This is going to be your first step towards the Gerber. Eventually, we'd like to build it up to a point where you have a 3D model of something. You export DXFs, and then you can cut it out on a CNC machine. This is a design to a table that I have made in the past. Um, but for right now, the precursor badge for the Gerber is the Shipoko. So you'll need to get this badge first and sort of get two or three Shipoko projects under your belt before you hop over to the Gerber, which is just a bigger, um, more complicated one. The, the Gerber basically requires you to have VCAR figured out and to do all of the same things that you do in Carbide Create, but with a, a more complicated interface is basically it. Um, there's the Carbide Create software is totally free to install. You can, you can get it, install it. Carbide Motion, you don't really want to put on your computer. You need to have the machine physically attached for it to work. So just Carbide Create is going to be enough that you can plan and design at home and then bring that in to make something. And don't put a lot of pressure to make anything big or complicated. Just make a little sign, make, make something small. It's good to get started and to get playing. You want to do a couple projects because there's some, some weirdness to this. Uh, we, we glossed over it, but in these early pictures, you can see I've got these strange green clamps holding things down, right? You've got to figure out how do you, how do you mount the clamps? How do you hold your piece still? All of those details need to be figured out. We focus really on the software side of it, but there's some of those like logistical pieces of how do you connect it that, that really, once you're in and doing, they'll make a ton of sense, uh, but it takes practice to make sure that your toolpath doesn't hit one of those green clamps. So that's why it's good to get in and do a few small projects rather than try and take on something very, very large. So there's lots of fun opportunity to make stuff this week, but really we want you to just be focused on trying to make anything at all and getting badged on the Shapoko. So uh, what we'll do when we come back to this, we're gonna talk a lot more about many different details. We'll talk about three axis CNC designs. So how do you get things that are, that are really three-dimensional, which other than V-carve toolpaths, we're probably not gonna do much three-dimensional design. Uh, we'll talk more about two and a half D designs. So how do you logistically plan for something like that? dog bones and end mills and sort of how do you build things with CNC machines, speeds and feeds, roughing and finishing. We'll go more into those details when we circle back to this unit. But the, the big thing for right now is just to get in and get moving and sort of press the buttons, get stuff to happen and make your first designs. Um, there's, there's lots of different ways that you can make this. And in Slack over the past week, I put in an example of a sign that I made for my mom's house with her address number. Those sorts of little gifts, I, we might be just past the gift giving season, but if you want ideas for what to do the next time it comes around, lots of little customized designs here can be lots of fun. Um, and so there's tons of opportunity to make this work. The wedding gift cutting board that I was working on, a few of you saw the charcuterie board, that one was made on the CNC. And so this, is, this has got lots of opportunity for you to make cool stuff. But for right now, just get your Shapoko badge, get in there, start playing, and have a good time. Um, any of the woodshop people will be able to badge you on this. It's a woodshop tool. And so it's our woodshop facilitators who are the ones that badge you. You'll definitely want to reach out to them. It is a new tool, so they have various levels of comfort with it. I know I've seen Jen use it, and I've seen uh, a, a few different people using the Shapoko. There's many members that are using it. So you'll want to make sure that you 
reach out to a facilitator and get yourself set up with a time. Um, but it's it's lots of fun to get in and get making. And then I'll be in this week, uh, this weekend, and I'll be in on Thursday, very likely. So if you want to be here while I'm around, I can help with those. And then Adam is good at the Shapoko, also is another facilitator that's good at it. Um, and so we can coordinate on some different times. So it'd be fun to come in and, and sort of root badge on this might even be useful. Uh, but you can install Carbide Crate and play around with some designs before we get to that. So I've talked for a lot longer than normal. I've, I went on sort of rambling things. I'm reawakening to what it's like to be a teacher. Sorry about that. <laughs> the, the holiday break is nice, but you get a little disoriented. Uh, and so let me stop sharing and what i'm really interested to hear about is uh how, what you what you guys did over the course of the the new year and so if you traveled if you made some fun stuff if you if you gave gifts to anybody that you had made how did that go over all those sorts of things it'd be fun to hear about fun to fun to see if you've got any pictures there's all sorts of cool things that we can that we can discuss and so um there's a part of me that wants to say, Lisa, are you are you ready? Do you think you'd be ready to present? Because we've got one other person in the space. And so it'd be fun for Lisa to just share. And then we can go through for everybody who's remote. You can tell us what you're up to. All right. She's she's getting her things. Cool. Uh, all right. I'll get out of the way. Yeah, have a seat. What? Happy New Year, everybody. <laughs> so um, basically what I gave are some of the things that I made in class. So I gave the blue laser cut box to my uh, my friend with the uh, 3D printed monkey inside because that's his thing. He has monkeys all over the place. And just the prop and other secret things inside that box in the process of taking everything out of there gave him great joy. So that's great. Um, let's see. That's pretty much it for things that, well, yeah, that's it. But um, I took it upon myself to further, you know, this is this is a long term project. So the the die that I made on the water jet that cut the the copper, well, I'm not sure where I've got you. So my next step was to figure out how to solder them together so that they became completely seamless while also making sure you always have to have a hole, at least one or two holes when you're soldering to let the air escape. But um, that's hard to do when you have two halves, how you're going to make that hole. It was a matter of filing each side, lining them up and hoping that when I flew, flowed the solder that it wouldn't fill those holes in. Yeah. Because I need those holes in order to connect these uh, in, to be a necklace. Mm -hmm. So it, it, oh, and not only that, but my torch failed. So I had to go through the process of uh, figuring out why it was failing. And it turns out it was the tank had a leak. Oh. And so I had to get the, you know, convince the place where I got the tank that that was a problem. And give me a new tank. And then uh, I bought a new regulator and it's beautiful. It works great. And that's how, why I finally got these done right. There you go. A regulator is really a surprisingly important part oh, yeah. of those pneumatic systems. Yes, because it, it, it makes the gas flow properly and right. it, you know what, what it's doing. Yeah, having good measurable control. Right. It's a big difference. So I felt really accomplished that I did this. I mean, those are incredible. <laughs> they, they look fantastic. Uh, I can't wait to see. It sounds like you're going to make more. Yeah, well, I also have to connect them. That's a complicated thing in and of itself. So that'll be the next step. I believe you. Yeah, that sounds complicated. So I think that's it. Cool. Uh, that was lots of fun and really neat. Let's see. Um, James, you've got your camera turned on. Are you ready to share with us what you've been up to? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yep. Cool. Um, so yeah, I did a bunch of practicing with Fusion and with Inkscape still. Um, I got badges on the 3D printer, which is cool. I made a little octopus and some little keychain. Um, it's fun. Pretty 3D printing is pretty cool. Uh, kind of bizarre to do, right? Um, 
And then over the break, I kind of just didn't want to look at my computer anymore. So I didn't. And I went the absolute opposite of CNC anything and decided to try hand carving. Uh, so I hand carved this little wizard man with just this knife. Uh, I've never done this before, and I think it came out pretty cool. Um, yeah, uh, that's really neat. Yeah. Uh, to the absolute opposite of anything computer controlled. <laughs> so yeah, that was pretty much it. But I'm uh, I'm pretty excited to mess with the Shapoko and the the Gerber and see what I can make. Yeah, it'll be lots of fun, and I think that well, I I really enjoy the CNC, but the handmade like whittling away to to get those <laughs> shapes is there's something magical about it too. Yeah, uh, it's fun. It's it, yeah. It's cool. That sounds, that sounds like a nice break. Yeah, but that's it. So cool. Great. All right. Let's see. Steve, you're the next one up. Did you, did you do anything exciting over the break? Anything fun? Yeah, well, we traveled a bunch, but uh, I also made a bunch of pizza, did a bunch of other baking. Uh, I got one of those outdoor pizza ovens last month. So that's, uh, that's, that's a new fixation. Uh, made some naan in that as well. Uh, and uh, I also made a pretty cool going away present for my boss's retirement. Uh, we, uh, I, I work for a publishing company. And so for a long time, there's been this tradition of everybody signs a, a blank book and that's kind of getting a little old. Uh, and so I had everybody write him postcards. And then I realized at the 11th and a half hour that I had no way to give them to him. So uh, I, I, uh, I made a, a laser cut and uh and and resin uh resin box just on the fly really sloppy with my overpour but uh sanded it down and took this one really really close and and you can actually see the 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 etched wood kind of showing through on that uh but then uh, on the other one i got a really just beautiful jewel tone on it i was really happy with the way that came out and then i've been making some picture frames um, and, and getting ready to play around with some Shu Sujiban on that. So I've been busy. Uh, it definitely looks like you've been busy. Uh, it also looks like my internet froze just now. Um, hello. Hello. Oh, all right. I'm back, I think, for the internet. That was... Cool. If you can hear me, lots of fun. I really enjoyed the Yale uh, engraving. That was that was really cool. Uh, Yushi, it looks like it looks like your your uh, little squad is is on camera. Do you guys want to share what you've been up to? Um. So we went to Make Haven yesterday, and um, I'm I'm Yushi's kid, by the way. If you didn't know, um, and I made a sticker. That's wow. That's awesome. It is. Was that and that was the first sticker you ever made, right? Yeah, Corey helped me. And uh, and what software did you use? You you did a ton of stuff to make that thing. Yeah, yeah, I used Inkscape, um, to make the design, and then I brought it over to the other computer on Bucket, and then I printed it out on the um sticker cutter machine thing. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty cool. And your brother made one too. And we, if, I, I hope that those stickers find fun homes. <laughs> oh, man. Do, do, do you want to tell, uh, tell everybody what you want to make tomorrow? No. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, they got totally hooked <laughs> because how awesome Corey was yesterday. So um, we decided to go back tomorrow and spend a whole day at McHaven and, and um, these guys have some other plans. Um, he wanted to make a, 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 a screen printing t-shirt. And then do you have another plan? Hoodie. A hoodie. Yeah, and, and Dorian also um, got really interested in the 3D printing. So we're going to make some more. Oh, yeah, that's it's, you know, people get excited, they get hooked. And I'm glad that that you all had fun. It was a, it was definitely like a family event. <laughs> so. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. That was lots of fun. Let's see, we've got 
Arvia, Norm, and Vincent on the call. Arvia, you unmuted first. You want to share? Yeah. Oh, goodness. I'm just looking at myself today. Um, I Can I share my screen? Uh, I... you, should, you should be able to. Okay. Yeah. What did I do this week? It was a really slow break. I did not do gifts. My family is really big. We try not to do gifts, but sometimes they... <laughs> they'll pop up with gifts and it's really annoying so my dad randomly popped up with gifts on Christmas and I was like oh god now I have to make him something <laughs> so basically I need to go back and do gifts for Christmas now for a few people um but I did make a few things let me see if I can share I'm going to turn off my camera and see if I can share my screen um oops. Select photo. You're on your screen on a phone. That's impressive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I made a little foundations folder. Can you can y'all see my screen? Um not, no? not not yet. Okay. Maybe this isn't gonna work. Um, um I think it should it should let you on my end. We can we can circle back if you want to. It, you should be able to share even if somebody else is talking because uh, multiple are allowed to share at the same time if you want a minute to just sort of dig through the the details or you could describe it you could say with words what you made oh, where is she? oh she's coming in i see a second arvia yep I can go last. I'll drop my photos in the Slack and then I can <laughs> like share them from there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever works. It's not a problem. Okay. Uh, cool. So let's do Vincent or Norm. If either of you wanna, if you're around, if you want, wanna- I'm not around, sorry. <laughs> All right, then you're going first. All right, cool. Um, let's see, share screen desktop. Here we go. Can you see it? Yep. Cool. So I caught up on updating the website. Um, well, sort of caught up on updating the website. I added in a lot of the photos that I had um, done before, as well as um, for some of the different units, I did some side projects ahead of time. I ended up um, adding those previous projects onto those units. I'm in the process of figuring out how I want to reorganize the site. If I'm thinking that if I can do it easily, I probably will have individual pages for individual projects and then mm -hmm. like link to them. So that way you'd be able to see, here's my progression um, through the, the different units, but then be able to click on, on the individual projects. So you'd be able to look at the different units and see he's, here's all the different projects that I did related to this subject. But then if you wanted yeah. to see how an individual project went, you'd be able to. Um, yeah. So if you scroll up to the top, um, you'd be able to see my first laser cut, um, a laser cut I did a little bit later, which was um, for presents that I was going to give. Um, this was for my cousin's girlfriend. This um, box that I made was for my cousin. Um, I spent New Year's with him. So um, yeah, so that was when I decided to give the um, Christmas presents because we weren't meeting up on Christmas. Uh, that's fun. And, he just got into tea, um, so I made him a little like tea tea bag holding box. And if he has it filled to the top, it'll say this is your least favorite tea. As you <laughs> as you finish it, and you only have one left, turns out it is your favorite. So it's time to refill. That's pretty great. And when you take the last one out, <laughs> the store out of tea. Much. I love it. Oh, that's that's really nice. I love like good jokes hidden in a little thing. Yeah, and these are like 3D prints that I did before, like the Halloween costume, something I did for my cousin, um, the fish. Yeah, I didn't really do anything new for the 3D printing. I did do, um, I did finish up the um, snails and the fish. Um, they're not pictured though, because it's um, more related to casting. Sure. No, I mean, you did a ton of 3D printing, so don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, that's part of why I was like, 
I'm kind of procrastinating on updating the site because I'm like, how am I supposed to put this in? Because I'm right now I'm having it in chronological order, but it doesn't really fit into the structure that I have the site on. Uh, it, it, you're definitely when you get to big, bigger, complicated sites, as as I'm sure you know, it's you, there's some dynamic to how do you want to structure it, sort of what's the nonverbal of how you're communicating it, and it you're totally doing what it takes to make to make it into a nice site. I really like it. Awesome, thanks. Oh, and I so in the process of doing the laser cutting, I did some. I did some more Inkscape practice and I did more hair pulling with the Inkscape practice. <laughs> um, I'm more still figuring pulling. out Inkscape. Yeah, Inkscape is definitely got a lot of quirkiness to it um, and vector design in general. If you're, if you're having a hard time, I really recommend watching some of the videos on YouTube about how to use it. Um, I was just chatting with Lisa before class about how the tutorials that I recommended, I recommend because they work for me, or the videos that I make, I think would be helpful for me, but I'm not always, I'm not always the best barometer for what would be the most helpful for each person. So you dig around a little bit, I'm sure you'll find one that resonates with you. And then you get, you get a couple projects in on Inkscape and it, and it tends to get a lot better. Yep. The, um, the issue that I've been facing, or something that I found really helpful, was the XML editor. I found the XML mm -hmm. editor in Inkscape. Yeah. So you're able to like hover over different items and see what the structure is like in code. Right. And, and you can see like how they're nested, things like that. Ab absolutely. And your your experience with a developer is going to make that double extra helpful. Um, and so that's that's really cool. I'd love to see what next time we're in the space together. I'd love to see how you're using that exactly because I bet it would be fun. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's, that's pretty much that's it awesome. so far. I'm I mean that it sounds like you had a great a great break, uh some nice gifts and a lot of good work. That's mm -hmm. really cool. Awesome. Norm, uh do you wanna are you there? You want to share for sure. us? Yeah. Um, yeah, we went to Austin, Texas to see what that was about. My daughter is out there for a while and it was nice, but I needed a Christmas present. So I took a block of wood and then rounded it with a, a bandsaw, uh, put it on the um, wood lathe and came up with a peanut bowl, which I gave my wife. And for myself, I uh, had a closet that I previously lit. It's got no internal lighting. And I used this little lantern up there, but I took an LED strip and wound it around the outside, got a little battery and a rocker switch. And now I have a brilliantly lighted closet, which makes me um, a lot happier than I used to be. That is awesome. And that was it. That's that's really cool. Uh, it, that's a that's a fun solution for a closet, and that battery is probably going to last you a long time. Yeah, because I only put it on every once in a while, uh, uh, and um, and it's it's terrific uh, improvement. I wouldn't yeah, have done it no, if that's... I hadn't taken this course. So that is my <laughs> my uh, my final project right there. <laughs> I mean that it's it's a great project. Really improves the quality of life. So that's great. Yeah, we're gonna actually. It's a good lean in. Our next unit is gonna be um, all about e textiles. So we're gonna circle back to circuits. It it feels sort of sort of wild cardish, but in the digital fabrication part of digital is like I O digital, like uh, you know electronics. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how you'd integrate electronics into textiles, which is lots of fun. We just, I just uh, worked with Ashley. We ordered a bunch of lights that are specifically designed to be sewn onto garments. So hopefully next week you'll be back to sewing and, uh, and putting lights in the clothes that are in your newly illuminated closet. So that would be fun. All right, and let's see. Arvia, are you back? Did we get the pictures uploaded? Yeah, I just switched to my computer because <laughs> um, it's just yeah. me here. 
Um, no, I don't know how to share my screen. I'm just guessing that maybe if you shut off the video, that may stop the, your ability to share the screen. I, I've never actually looked into that, but I thought I thought I heard you say you were shutting off video, and it looks like you've got a a, a, a background picture. Oh, I think I think she is trying to disconnect and reconnect. Let's give her a minute um, to to try and do that. In the in the meantime, the the big things that I think I want you to give a shot or to try this week is to hop onto the Shapoko. I think you're all going to enjoy it. It's just, it's a fun tool to get in and play around with. And it's the step in the right direction to get to the Gerber, which really unlocks like another level of CNC work because it's just so much bigger. And then uh, to also start to get excited about glowing clothes. And so there's, which I'll send some links out through, uh, Slack this week, just so you can start to get ideas. But there's some really cool things people have made. If you get to very high end stuff, you can put like an Arduino in them also and motion sensors. There's there's some ladies who've made wonderful sparkle dresses. So like when the dress is flowing and uh, and moving, it it twinkles while it's moving. Uh, then there's some other ones where you can just how how to, you know, you can make make all sorts of stuff happen. Uh. Yeah, uh, Arvia, the one week out from the world and all of a sudden you forget how all the tech works. That is 100% where I'm at right now. Uh, every, every so often it happens to all of us. And so no worries, no pressure. Uh, show and tell is, is a fun part, but it, you know, it's, you know, it doesn't have to happen. Uh, yeah. I can, I can keep stalling if you just need another second or two. <laughs> Let's try this one more time, y'all. It is more like two weeks out of work, and I'm off this week too. So I am, I'm, I'm just here. Can y'all see my stuff now? Yeah, it's on. You got it. Oh. Wow, we made it. We made it. Um, okay. <laughs> All right. So the main thing I feel like that was great that I made this week. I made my friend this lithophane. Of course, it's not gonna blow up. But put up. Okay, here we go. This is lift the lift the thing oh. uh picture of their grandmother for their um altar. And I think it came out very beautiful and that they is loved incredible. it. Thank you. And I got some wood finally, y'all. Y'all know it's been a saga for me to find some, but I got some from this person in somewhere um where was I at in Walling Prairie but I got a lot of walnut and I'm very excited about it and I started this cutting board and my plan for this week is to put it on the CNC and in the middle of it I want to cut out a name and put walnut as an insert in it and so Walker is really great um like facilitator in the wood shop oh, yeah. Um, but he was, was gone this, this last week. So I was waiting for either Walker or you, Corey, <laughs> to try this. Yeah. I didn't want to mess up my nice board. Um, and yeah, I also made a badge holder for my Make Haven badge um, on the 3D printer. And oh, I don't want to play this video. It's from my Instagram. And I tried <laughs> to start making a spoon. <laughs> This is, this is my late hour attempting at carving out a spoon and I have not finished it, but first steps of like carving out the basic shape. <laughs> and yeah, this is where we're at right now. And then I stopped because um, like my arms got tired. And yeah, that's about it. I want to design this, Corey, but this is what I want your help with because I want one of these holders for a canvas to take pictures. And I feel like that is probably easily designed for the 3D printer. And I'm I'm just having trouble in um, Fusion 360, so yeah, um, then I could get some help with that this week, so that I could absolutely something like this. Maybe I'm not going to completely copy their design, but I'm going to kind of copy their design because I, I really. I mean, <laughs> when you're when you're just learning copying people's designs, I take as you're not trying to make money off of it. You're just oh. trying to learn the software, build something for yourself. I say copy the design. 
100 right. okay if you're trying to sell it it's a whole different story yeah, but you know no. you're just trying it's to, to, to take some pictures <laughs> yep uh to hold it yeah it's to hold things while you're what's it to, to hold a canvas down on something you said yeah to hold like boards like a like poster board or whatever background you want to use mm. to, like take pictures of products it's just they're like Got a board holder um so i was going to put yeah. like wallpaper and different things on like a foam bo board and use it as a backdrop cool. that makes that makes total sense for like framing photos for products that that mm -hmm. would be great yeah yeah sure. absolutely Cool. That it sounds like you were all very productive. I just drove around the Midwest, <laughs> uh, and and so I'm really excited to get back into it to to build more stuff. Uh, I'll be around this week, definitely Thursday and Sunday, and uh, and then lots of the woodshop facilitators will be helpful with the Shapoko. So if you want to play around with that, you can do it. I think that with all of the Inkscape things that we've done, you're going to be delighted at how nicely Carbide Create integrates with that. So I, I think that you'll be able to play around. Um, don't get lost in the details of speeds and feeds. We'll get to that later. Um, but I'm excited to see all the cool things that you all made and to see what you'll make this week and to start to brainstorm what's going on. Uh, one, one more detail that we should say before we're done, next week is our last like lesson week of this unit section of foundations. And then we're gonna have an, an integrated project week. Where we're gonna ask you to be creative and make something that's your own design and sort of bring together all the weird stuff that we've done. Lots of you have been already working on fun integrated projects, but this will be a week where we just sort of go after that as our singular goal, where you can integrate, you can try and if you wanted to get a badge that maybe you missed, you could do that. But the main focus would be on you getting creative and integrating these skills to to sort of show each other how that looks with the skills that you've acquired and, and what you want to do. So just thinking a little bit ahead to those to those goals, there'll be lots of fun to be had in those times. So I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'm looking forward to another good week of making things. And we can all, you know, keep masks on and stay healthy. That's that's always the goal too. So with with that, it is, you know, our normal ending time. So let's not hold anybody too long. It's time to maybe it's time to get to bed soon. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe not for us. We gotta pack up. But uh with you all who are logged in at home, you have a great night and we'll see you around the shop this week. So see everybody. Happy New Year. Bye.